time for some questions from the, uh, the audience. Come on, don't be afraid. did was I looked at the um, IC50s for all of them and just multiplied them at five. That's what I found was the, uh, that's what worked for one, the one nanomolar reflumolas. The <coughs> IC50 for reflumolas is uh, 200 picromolars, so it seemed that I thought five times greater would be a safe enough uh, safe factor to add in. Uh, part of the reason why I think this didn't work is because PD10 is localized to the cell bodies and not found in the dendrites, uh, which is where LTP is occurring. So it would make sense that blocking PD or inhibiting PD10 wouldn't have any effect on the injury response. Okay. And then this work was in vitro, right? All in vitro. All Everything in vitro? was done with the um, slice culture model. Okay. Has anyone put this RFN into mice? So this has been mice? done with a number of different PD4 inhibitors after not after blast though, after uh, fluid percussion injury. Um, so just more reflective of the tertiary injury or civilian type injury, accelerated uh, driven. Um, and it's shown, phosphodiesterase 4 inhibition has shown positive effects on uh, ameliorating those, or those injury induced LTP and behavioral deficits as well. Have they looked at other tissues, um, not just like brain tissue? I don't, I don't think so. No, it's purely a TBI lab, okay. so yeah. Ready. Great work. Thank you. Um, easy, easy question. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, do you have any idea why the onset of the drop in potentiation is only, like, it doesn't start immediately? If it's only at the one hour or past that time point? Yeah, so when we started that study, we actually were interested in uh, the hypothesis we had was that maybe there's some sort of uh, rigid disruption of the connection of two neurons that could be. I mean, that, that blast overpressure would induce it immediately. Um, that was kind of our reasoning for looking at that early time point, uh, which we did see. So to us, it appears that there's some sort of secondary process that's occurring, whether uh, some, we didn't really look into that, but uh, the potential mechanism we thought maybe is like calpane activation or calcium neuron activation. So things that are really driven by calcium activation, which is it's shown to occur after TBI um, more generally. So some sort of secondary activation that's occurring um, with protein kinases, phosphor phos phosphatases, phosphodiesterases, things like that. So if it's a really quick cellular change of what it's producing in terms of protein synthesis. Well, like what do you define as quick? I mean that's 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 yeah. what we were looking for. And that's what I don't I think that process is occurring seems like that first 24 hours is really a critical time point in yeah. in TBI. There's a lot going on um, that would be interesting. I mean, it would be interesting to look at type to tighter that difference between one and 24 hours, maybe looking at six hours, looking at something that would align better with what we saw after the reflumolast efficacy. Um, because that, my guess is that that would align fairly well that um, when reflumolast stops working is some critical time point where there's no recovery that can happen and that, that process is occurring over several hours. And with that narrow therapeutic window, you imagine that just being in a med kit? So that's the idea is like the delayed delivery um, would be helpful. I mean, we don't, there's some, I mean, although Rufflumlas uh, is FDA approved, there's been some concern with um, effect, emetic effects or vomiting that are associated with it. So I don't think it'd be ideal to give just for the off chance that there's side effects that occur occur. I don't think it would be ideal to give prophylactically, but it's something that this would be great to be paired in down in the future when we have better diagnostics, whether it's in the field diagnostics to say a certain pressure has occurred or I guess in our in this case we identified impulse thresholds. So a certain impulse has occurred, identify you as having experienced a TBI, then administer it then. The nice thing about the six hour time point is ideally you could come back be, be um, I mean, the way currently for the military would have to happen is that you'd have to go out to combat, experience a bomb blast, 
come back, be, ident- be looked over by a medic, and then at that point be administered. So that would be currently how it would how it would be administered. Like a reasonable right. 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 Mike. Okay. Um, can you go back to the slide where you look at the four different levels? I think the last thing. Yeah, in the beginning? Yes. No, I'm sorry. Yes. yes. Uh-huh. Um, on the last one, the level nine, mm-hmm. is there a qualitative implication for a negative transubstantiation there? So, I mean, if you think about it, you're getting, <clears throat> we're saying this is potentiation over baseline. So you're still generating, like, your pre induction signal, it's all normalized to your pre induction signal. So okay. you're seeing a slight decrease okay. in that. Um, Typically, there's another process known as LTD, or, L- or long-term depression, which is hallmarked by a loss of potentiation. Um, this is a common molecular mechanism that happens, like this, which would be the method of, you can't remember everything, so you're, you're depotentiating these neurons. Um, so there could, if it's a significant loss, that could be a problem. Um, but I haven't seen anything that after LTP induction you see a significant loss. So LTP and LTD are induced by different um, electrical stimuli. It's all about the rate. Uh, LTP is at 100 hertz stimuli, where LTD is at like one to five hertz. So it's fast stimulation versus slow stimulation. So okay. yeah. And then um, if you don't mind the second more slider after this. Yep. Um, the uh, looking at this graph, is there some implication, I guess, of uh, easier, so you're saying the four groups are the same for the previous slide or no? So not all the same. We have here is this um, level one, level two, and level four. We haven't filled in for level three yet. That's still that's work in progress by uh, other people okay. um, in the lab, Nevin specifically. <laughs> um, we're looking at this is a sham exposure, so you're not getting any blast exposure there, being a zero. Um, so, uh, go ahead. I was say, so is there evidence that um, this would be a linear relationship or is it just monotonic? So because we don't have, it's most likely not a linear relationship. If you look at um, another, Andrew Kang in our lab, previous student, had uh, put, put out a paper that looking at different functional changes after stretch injury, varying combinations of strain and rate, and found that most of the functional measures, uh, he didn't look at LTP, unfortunately, but uh, most of his other functional measures were changed in a complex fashion, whether it's with both strain and rate. So it's most likely not a linear relationship, but at this point we don't have enough information to pick a proper fit to that. Um, But yeah, it's most likely some complex squared or cubed relationship with both strain and rate potentially. So maybe a little premature, have you guys had talks with people that do the helmet design in terms of informing those design criteria? I'm thinking so, maybe they already have this, but like, you know, shockwave transducers or sensors where like, oh, it turned red for that person. So it there's some, it, it becomes difficult there. There has been some work, we, all right, back up. We have not actually had significant conversations with any specific helmet designers. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of our work will help to uh, inform these finite element models, which are typically what's used a lot to try and design these different materials that can be used for helmets. Um, there, speaking of that, there have been some means to try and mediate this effect of the blast exposure. Uh, for example, having like a face shield in front of the helmet that could potentially um, impede that interface between the shockwave and the head. Uh, it's shown some success, however, I, you're getting to a point with that that uh, technology where it's like difficult for the soldier to do what it has to do. So that's down the line. Down the line, there has been some work to develop. Sort of there, I, one that comes to my mind is this sort of sticker system that has these crystals on it, identifying overpressures that could be or experienced at the head, and it's sort of just a color change that, like, when a certain threshold has been passed, um, that color will change on the crystal. Uh, that still hasn't really been worked out completely. But again, the other thing with this stuff is that it's all in vitro still, right? right. So I had the caveat that you can't necessarily extrapolate these specific levels to uh, animal or human yet. It still needs to be sort of iter- iteratively increased as we look at other um, other larger macro scale models. Any other questions? 
questions? All right. Thank you very much to the audience. We excuse you and we have our closed session.